Hi again, everybody. Hey, we'll uh, make this really little quick video, and it's sort of mostly speculation here on my part. So I've been involved um, online in a little discussion as uh, about uh, Clifford Van Beek, as um, I always do. And the, part of the question here is sort of what went wrong with National Pastime? How come this game didn't sell better? And it really is a good question. Um, I mean, we can point to things like there wasn't much advertising. As we know, there was that little uh, little thing in the uh, sporting news. And I mean, you talk about like a really, really little clip. I, I can show this to you. I think I've shown this to you before. Um, if you bear with me here for a second, I'll go ahead and find... Uh, let's see, where did I put this? I think I have it still in this downloads folder. Um, yeah, here we go. So this was on uh, uh, December, um, let's see here. This is on uh, December uh, 12th, I'm sorry, December 11th, 1930, right? And so, I mean, you really have to sort of see this if you haven't seen it yet to get an idea of just how small this advertisement really is, right? So this is what the first page looked like. Remember at this time, the Sporting News was um, not uh, a tabloid size publication. This was, um, I think they call it a broadsheet. It was only eight pages. And, um, you know, you see everything was done up in columns like this, just like sort of an old-fashioned uh, newspaper. So uh, Shane O'Collins, um, his... Um, or uh, I guess you would probably say John. I'm trying to remember how they would say Shane. Anyway, I have to go back and read those books about the 1919 uh, 19 uh, White Sox again. You, know, you see his photo here on the first page, and you can see sort of how big that is, right? Um, and uh, you can see stuff like here's the size of this cartoon here on page number two. Here's the picture as part of this advertisement for the Sporting News All-Star team. They did a lot of this during the um, Depression to uh, try to get people interested. There were some advertisements. So it's funny, if you look at the Sporting News from, say, like 1905 or 1906, you'll see tons of ads. Here, not so many. And then some of these, I mean, who is this ad? Um, you know, uh, who, who are they going after for this ad? You know, right now for your facts about night lighting at your park. I mean, it shows you who was reading the sporting news, right? Very, very interesting stuff. And, um, I mean, you can see that, I mean, if you were reading newspapers in those days, I don't know if you've ever seen this in like old movies, you'll see like the old guy, you know, who's got like a, a big magnifying glass he holds up to his eyes or whatever. So you can see what exactly it is the newspaper says. I mean, it really was a real thing because the size of newspaper print then was not exactly huge. But this, as we go through this, this kind of gives you an idea of sort of what the size is of most of the um, advertisements and sort of the size of most of the photos and things like that, right? And as you scroll through here, you can miss it if you don't know where it is, right? It's right here. This is the advertisement for National Pastime, which is small. Now, the text itself it looks like it's probably just about the same size and uh, slightly different, maybe slightly more bolded font than the text of everything else in the paper. But it's hidden over here almost like it's, you know, the uh, stamp on a postage card. If you think about how you would hold the newspaper, right? This would be at the very, very back and sort of on the bottom uh, of the fold. I'm guessing that the fold of the paper actually ends up being like right around here. I don't know how well you can see my mouse. It's probably like right up here where the uh, statistics um, uh, for the, uh, what is this, the American Association? Yeah, these American Association statistics end. That's probably right around where the fold is. And so it's kind of mashed in here. I could see how you could have some problems at the um uh, ink was still a little bit wet, how this would be smeared. You know, it's also very likely because this is right here on the uh, fold, the, um, what would you call this? The horizontal fold of the uh, newspaper is very likely that this might be ripped somewhere. Or, I mean, if like the paper is going to be ripped or somebody wants, I don't know if they want to save for whatever reason, like this picture, you know, of uh, whoever this is, uh, Tony Lazari, you know, and all this other stuff about him, like they would save that. And it's possible that this could accidentally be cut with scissors or something like that. I mean, this is not really the ideal place to put this sort of advertisement. It really isn't, right? And it probably is not going to get a bit jillion eyes on it um and uh whoops uh let's get back into it here yeah and um, as you can see here my uh, face is kind of covering it up but if i um, go over here this investment securities ad is much better done um, and is much easier to read right uh this ad is up there with like the umpire school ad which is also a little bit better easier to read because you don't have that um, little bit of the advertisement here right let's see if uh been having some problems with this thing. Yeah, it's not letting me zoom in. I'm not entirely sure why. But um, if you can really, really zoom in on this and see it, you can see like Fox and you can sort of see what the card looks like, but not 
not entirely. I'm not even sure what name this is right next to him. Um, anyway, though, that gives you an idea of sort of what that advertisement really looked like. I mean, I would definitely say that that probably is part of the reason why um, National Pastime failed. I mean, just because the advertisement wasn't that great. But at the same time, there's another reason that I think that we're not necessarily looking at and we might not um, be so accustomed to these days. And uh, that is the fact that um, kids back, in, not just in the 30s, but also we know in like the 50s and even the 60s, just wouldn't think about baseball so much once October was done. I mean, the World Series was done in very, very early October. This advertisement comes out in December. Now, I know it comes out in a baseball-oriented newspaper, right? And the sporting news in 1930, there's only baseball. There's no football anywhere, no hockey, no nothing. There's no basketball to speak of. You know, who cares, right? It's only baseball. But if you're a kid and you're thinking about, like, a Christmas present, you know, you're probably not going to be thinking so much about, I want a baseball game, unless you're really, really a fan of baseball, right? The reason why I bring this up is because in the baseball card world, um, when you learn about uh, the old days of uh, cards being printed in different series, you learn that um, the series that were printed and sold between like April and August or so tended to sell well. And then the series that were at the very end of the season didn't sell well. I say this because most famously in the baseball card industry, the high numbers of 1952 tops came out, I believe, in like early October 1952. That includes the Mickey Mantle rookie card, right? Um, one of the reasons why uh, there are so few of those high numbers out there is quite simply because they didn't sell well. They didn't sell well in part because stores didn't want to take it because they knew from experience the kids didn't buy baseball cards in October. They wanted to buy football stuff. They didn't want to buy baseball stuff, right? Um, that's part of the reason I think why National Pastime may have had so many economic problems with this idea. It's not a bad idea to go after the Christmas market, but really, I keep wondering. I mean, Van Beek had waited from 1925 to like late 1930 to finally market the game. Why didn't he wait like a couple more months to wait for opening day in 1931? He then probably could have had the 1930 stats instead of as we're as I'm presuming at least him using the 29 stats, you know, and it might have worked a little bit better to go at it um, early. Um, in contrast, and then I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, J. Richard Seitz, when he repackaged National Pastime and added things on and sold it as APA in 1951, he doesn't even register his company officially until February 1951. And the game starts selling, I think, either in March or April. We'll figure that out when we get to it. It won't be that hard for us to figure out. But he waits until baseball season to start selling the baseball product instead of selling it when it's absolutely not baseball season, right? I don't know if he did that strategically or not, but um, I do think he had a little bit more success. Another thing to notice is that sites didn't print, you know, 500 copies. My theory is that National Pastime was probably like 250 copies of the American League and 250 of the National League and then 500 sets of boards. That's what I think really happened. But um, as far as like sales, I mean, who knows what it was like. Now, the first edition of Appa Baseball, the 1950 season, 1951 edition, I believe we know that that only had 149 copies printed. That, that number stands out in my mind for whatever reason, and only like 10 copies have survived. Um, but uh, Seitz was smart and decided not to have a very large print order and instead to build things up slowly rather than trying to like hammer everything home at first, right? Anyway, that's just sort of my thoughts on the subject. Um, I'd be very interested to know what you think, if you've ever even thought about this stuff or not. Um, but I do, as I've been thinking about this, I do suspect that one of the reasons why National Pastime failed is just because it came out at the wrong time of the year. And it may have been easier um, to have success if it had come out um, instead, like in April. Um, so a few thoughts, a little bit of speculation on my part. I hope you have a good day. Talk to you later. Bye.